Um, on the programme, um, I'm meant to be Becky Spate, the Chief Executive of the RSPB. Um, you'll notice that I'm not Becky Spate. My name is Paul Walton. I'm one of her employees. Um, I am the Head of Habitats and Species for the RSPB here in Scotland. And um, I live in Glasgow, I'm from Glasgow, so it's my privilege to welcome you all to our city. Um, I apologize for any hassles you've had getting here, but I really hope you have uh, an enjoyable stay here. And let's all just join together and hope that this conference achieves what it must for our environment. Okay, so um, first of all, I just want to say a really warm welcome to the IUCN Peatlands Pavilion and a, a huge thanks to the IUCN for, for, for setting up this space. I know it was a really, really difficult job for them to do so and I, I, I know that they've, they've done it really, really well. So thanks to the IUCN. Today, you're going to hear uh, about peatlands in the UK. You're going to hear about where they are, you're going to hear about the threats that they face, the huge benefits that they can bring to us and to the natural environment. And you're going to hear about the work that's being done to restore these peatlands and to protect them by the RSPB, but also perhaps more importantly, by our partners across the devolved UK countries. <coughs> and there are many of them. And I want to open by first of all saying a huge thanks to all of our partners over the past 35 years uh, who've helped us in our work to restore peatlands. We have um, an expert panel of speakers, most of them are a lot more expert than I am, I have to, I have to admit. Um, and then that's going to be followed by a Q&A session. So anyone who's listening around the world, worldwide, can send those questions in. Anyone here in the audience will give you a microphone and you can ask questions if you if just single us, sing, signal out to us after the, the talks have finished. Um, but we're going to begin today um, with something of a treat. So we're going to begin with Vanessa Kisule. Now, Vanessa uh, is one of the 12 hot poets who were commissioned to work with environmental NGOs in the build-up to COP26 and to write a series of poems that will save the planet. So to begin with, a short video of Vanessa um, with, with her poem about peatlands, which has got the beautiful title called The Earth's Thirst. Thank you. And as the quick comma of a bird skims the air, some secret it doesn't care to share with us on its wing, I think of how we're stood on history right now, in all its wet, thick murk. The past muffled under grass, the then, the now, the threatened potential after. I imagine I'm Kate Bush, the wind whipping long braids against my face. But fear cannot find me amongst the heather's stoic bristles. The whistle and slap of air is mighty. I bow to it, humbled. The ghosts of birds departed haunt the hills. What once shook and bellowed wheezes. What took centuries to build must now reconfigure in less than ten years. A finger points to the cracks, the crumbling sigh of soil. Look, we must put back what we took. Kept wet, this brooding land will keep its brutal beauty. Sit fat and proud, just set jelly gleaming like scheming obsidian. Hold carbon close, slake the earth's thirst, reverse the worst of our choices. Though so far away from the knot of city life, the neat shaven grass of botanical parks, this place knows our deepest need. All we must do is feed it. The ground bounces under me, twice swallows my wellies, my breath, yet hope finds me here. Mouth a furrowed O, shrunk back tongue. I am dumb, I am holy, I am sorry. Big, grim, gorgeous bog. For all the bad press, the stress of all our unchecked greed. Here, a poem in penance. A long, slow drink 
for your troubles. Okay, you'll, for, you'll forgive me for uh, suggesting that that might be the most wonderful thing that you hear in the whole uh, conference. Um, so huge thanks to Vanessa for that. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, now we're going to go to our first speaker. Uh, and this is uh, someone who's well known to me. This is Dr. Ollie Watts, um, who has been working on climate policy for the RSBB for more years than I care to remember. Um, he's going to be on video. He's not here in person. So um, I'll just hand straight over to Ollie now, if that's all right, tech guys. Are we okay? Thumbs up there. And there's Ollie. Hi, Ollie. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for, for that introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, following Vanessa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to steal a couple of lines from Vanessa's poem, uh, I, which I loved all of it, as, as I'm sure you did. You know, the, the finger point of the cracks, the crumbling sigh of the soil, but she also says, look, we must put back what we took. And talking about describing the, the brutal beauty, and I love those two, two words together of, of, of peatlands, um, we must reverse the worst of our choices. And I think those are two things that are really key. We must put back what we took. Mm -hmm. We must reverse the worst of our choices. And actually, I'll add, add one thing on hearing so that I'm now for the first time. Alan Hope finds me here. I think my slideshow is not moving on. There we go. So I'm talking about protecting and harnessing the power of peat to give an overview of the UK. And I think this can be summed up in one word, which is transformation. Transformation from misuse to good use. Um, from harvesting peat's natural inherent benefits um, to, yes, to harvest, sorry, to, apologies, to actually harvest peat's natural inherent benefits, to go from private exploitation and gain to generate the widespread public benefits, from short-term gain towards a longer-term sustainable use future. For climate, of course, and for nature, of course, too. And those two things with peatlands are absolutely the both sides of, of the coin. And that really means that rewetting is inevitable. Um, it's urgent, essential and inevitable. So it's best to get on and do that now so we can harvest the benefits as soon as possible. And it's actually cheaper to do so as well um, before the warmer summers and the drier summers start to make some of this transformation a little bit more difficult to do. So we probably know most of what the misuses are, but I'll just quickly run through a few things. Um, there's burning vegetation on peatlands, um, the picture on the left. There's exploitation of peatlands for, um, for gardening and for horticulture for mining and on a commercial scale, such as the photograph on the right at Bolton Fell Moss in North Cumbria. There is drainage, which of course is inherent to just about every misuse of peat um, that, 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 we've, that, that we've managed to put these, these wonderful areas to. There's intensive production from, from animals, of crops, particularly in, in the lowland peatlands, and also for sport. There's tree planting, uh, commercial forestry, um, in the wrong places, which doesn't really have benefit for carbon, and it certainly doesn't have benefit for peatlands um, or nature. There's putting inappropriate things on peatlands, tracks, infrastructure, wind farms. Um, and then a long-standing problem that is now larger resolved, that has also helped to put our peatlands, or contributed to putting our peatlands in a poor condition, is atmospheric pollution. So let's not forget about that. 
Let's not forget also that a lot of this, what we now regard as misuse, has been from people trying to make peatlands more productive, trying what they saw in their times to get the best of them, but with a blind spot for all the things that healthy peatlands give us, which we are now much more aware of. So good use, what's positive use of peatlands? It's about car carbon storage, it's about it's about hanging on to that to those thousands of hundreds and thousands of years of carbon that is stored there that are now emitting. It's about getting nature back onto our peatlands. It's about water management, particularly in the upland catchments. It's about enjoyment. It's about recreation and adventure for those who venture out onto the peatlands. And certainly um, in lowland England, these are the closest areas to near wilderness that we can get to. Um, very useful for science to find out more about carbon, about plants, about nature and about our place in this world. Moving a little bit on to good use for economic use, there's a lot of opportunity for wetland crops, I'll come on to that later, and indeed for extensive grain grazing and maintaining sport for those who pursue those activities. Now the policies to do this, the framework, is actually now largely in place. Um, Right at the overarching level, all our governments in our four countries have, have binding responsibilities for both climate change, of course, and that's why we're here today, and for nature. Um, we have an IUCN peatland strategy um, that signed up to by all four governments that requires two million hectares of peatland restoration in the next couple of decades. We have the Climate Change Committee. Um, advising us to restore all of our upland peat and take action on lowland peat and urgent action on peat in gardening. England and Scotland both have action plans published um, with initial targets for 35,000 hectares and 250,000 hectares of upland peat to be restored and that work has now started. And DEFRA in its target, sorry, in its plan, actually for me, encapsulates in one sentence everything that we need to do. The DEFRA plan actually says, all uses of peat should keep the peat wet and in the ground. So let's do that and let's take that to all countries. One thing that's slightly missing is firm finalised plans for Northern Ireland and Wales. Northern Ireland's plan has just um, been out for consultation, so we hope to see that formalised soon, and I hope Wales will follow that uh, quickly. And then the next target is for England and Scotland to move on from its first initial phase of restoration to plan and to fund for the next stage when the real work, the real volume, the real area of restoration actually needs to take place. So why is restoration for carbon so important? Well, greenhouse gas emissions from peatlands are around 23 or 24 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent every year from the UK. And in a whole UK context of all our UK greenhouse gas emissions, that's between five and 6% um, of, of, of the total greenhouse gas emissions um, from the UK. So if we don't restore our peatlands, we cannot meet our net zero targets. So it's an essential nature-based solution contributing uh, to, to net zero. The Commission on Climate Change um, advises that all our peatlands should be restored by 2045, ideally 2050 at the latest, uh, and I, will, I would um, uphold that. Um, but I'd also say let's not forget our lowland raised bog habitat too, which the CCC um, omits from that target. Whoops, gone too far, sorry. Restoration for nature, of course, really important to the RSPB, our primary reason for being. Um, and this has been an incredibly long-standing concern going right back to 1990, when we first discovered that science and special scientific interests were being ripped up and commercially exploited for, for peat to sprinkle in people's gardens. And we know we've learned right in the recent that the UK nature ranking globally is incredibly poor, I think around 12th from the bottom globally. Our SSSI condition is really poor. Appro approximately 80% of our peatland is in poor condition. And even on our best sites, um, the, European, the sites of European importance, um, the amount of blanket bog that's in good condition is woefully short, only around 360 kilometers squared, square kilometers. 
around 10 times that not in good condition and around 18,000 kilometers square kilometers actually we don't know what the condition is but we know that restoration is easy or relatively simple and that it works and it actually works pretty quickly um, at Dovestone, the RSPB has been working with uh, United Utilities, and now we've got breeding wading birds numbered in, uh, sorry, doubled in just 10 years from, uh, from starting rest from restoration works. Carbon restoration is equivalent in effect largely to nature restoration. It's all about habitat condition. That's the platform for what we're doing for both nature and for carbon. So recovering by 2045, the, the Climate Change Committee pretty much has that. And again, I'll urge there is urgency before climate change impacts harm nature, perhaps a little bit more urgently than, um, than the carbon target. And let's not also forget that we have a 2030 nature recovery target. Um, so we should stop doing some of our, the opportunity to stop doing some of the damaging habitat practices such as burning on peat soils right now and build from those first steps that have been made in England and Scotland to swiftly progress commitment to stopping burning by the start of, of next year's burning season. That can really help nature. What about the lowlands? Um, the lowlands um, are a hugely important economic area of, from peatlands, but over half of the total UK peatland greenhouse gas emissions come from this area, which is only 14% of our peatland area. So that's over half the emissions from just one seventh of the area. And here's where transformation really is, 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 the, is the way forward. And it's what we need. We, we need to trans transform to wetland farming and economic use that's in harmony with nature at a landscape scale. And I think the opportunities here are actually really exciting to turn these areas for which unsustainability is, in, is almost the byword for what goes on there. And the farmers are beginning to, is much more awareness now that, this is, that they are nearing the end of their peat soils if, if continue methods at the moment. It will require transformation, it will require some imagination, but the ideas and the opportunities for new products from food to fiberboard to energy, uh, bioenergy crops at a small scale, to in making insulation, medicines, and even peat replacement in gardening. There is huge opportunity. Yes, it requires investment, it requires a bit more research, it requires um, work into building supply chains, uh, machinery, water management, and helping those farmers to, to transition to sustainable um, farming. But at the end of it, it's about making economic gain to um, and using peatlands for their natural benefits and for nature opportunities too. The Climate Change Committee has targets for this, um, which I actually think are rather weak. And the RSPB would like to see half of these lowland uh, economically used areas um, reverted to wetlands or brought into wetland economic management by 2030 and all of it by 2040. Gardening, gardening and horticulture, gosh such a long time, so many missed targets, um, the most recent one being set in 2011 for by 2020 peat to have ended retail sales in our garden centres and, and DIY chains and we're only halfway there in round figures towards that which is a really, really poor performance. We have country policies, um, both in England and Scotland, and there was um, the Northern Ireland consultation included that too. But when is this going to happen? It's quite clear that we need strong legislation to, to, to halt the use of peat in gardening. Um, there are plenty of opportunities out there, um, as Monty Don has been on, on social media again recently supporting the RSPB's latest pledge on this. The Commission on Climate Change has a target by 2023 to end peat in gardening, and I think that would be just about achievable and absolutely what we need to do. This should cover both sales, both use and extraction, the whole cycle of, econo of this form of economic exploitation. And also public procurement, which was supposed to have ended uh, in 2015, but the Guardian newspaper a fortnight ago um, highlighted that Forest England, 65% of its composts are peat based and that is absolutely appalling. So the target is to end that immediately. Clearly all this is going to cost money um, 
But the Office for National Statistics um, has put a price on this between 8 billion and 22 billion pounds over the next 100 years. But actually, they've also calculated that would save 109 billion pounds in terms of reduced carbon emissions alone. So that's a five to 13 times a recost. And that's just looking at carbon alone. That's not looking about the nature benefits. That's not looking about the water benefits, the water management and the water uh, cleanliness benefits, nor the health, well-being and recreation and adventure that we, we can all get from having wonderful peatlands. Um, in really good condition. So we know what we want to do. Um, and our attitude now, we get much better understanding. We've built a much better clarity about what we need to do with our peatlands and change these from wastelands, as they used to be called, and they're on some of the old maps as wastelands, to actually reviving to be the wonderful places that they can and should be. There's a lot to do to put this bad use to history and good use for the future, yet we've started. We've made an encouraging start, but we're really still only at the toehold of doing what we need to do. And yes, it will take time for these habitats and ecosystems to recover, but they can recover. And with this investment, they will um, recover. Similarly, the investment to transform wetland farming is required, but it can do that. We can transform these areas. And indeed, this investment is required because it is the only sustainable economic future for our lowland peatlands. And then thinking back to why we're all here in Glasgow, amongst all the challenging things that we need to do to save our planet, restoring peatlands is probably one of the easier things that we can do and that we need to do. So I will end just by reminding of what DEFRA's line was in the England peat action plan. All uses of peat should keep, sorry, all uses of peatland should keep peat wet and in the ground. So let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ollie. Um, yes, it, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a monumental challenge. It, it's a scary challenge, but um, I'm so pleased and proud to hear RSPB colleagues speaking with a note of optimism, because I think if we're not optimistic, then um, the, these challenges are, are just going to derail us as a species. So um, we, need, we need some optimism. So thanks for that, Ollie. And uh, we also need expertise. And that leads me on very neatly to our next speaker, who is my colleague from our team in Northern Ireland, the RSPB team in Northern Ireland, John Martin is the, is, is the head of policy there and um, is frankly one of the smartest operators that, that I know and have come across in my long career at the RSPB. So I'm going to hand over now um, with respect to John Martin from Northern Ireland. Thank you, Paul. Very kind of you to say so. I'll buy you a pint later for that. Um, thanks very much, folks, and great to be here uh, in Glasgow today. Um, and great to see a lot of the great work that's been happening across the UK for peatland restoration. And as the uh, previous speaker, Ali, um, has said, it's a really positive step forward that we can take uh, to manage peatland. And one of the easiest things um, that we can do um, to help lock carbon in the ground. I'm going to talk a wee bit about um, valuing our peatlands in Northern Ireland. Um, and I'm going to start off with a bit of a broader perspective on the importance of valuing our peatlands. Um, valuing it morally, um, valuing it ecologically, but also valuing it economically as well. So peatlands, um, I guess for us as an organisation, you know, we, we are valuing it from the economic and, and uh, environmental benefits um, that exist within it. Um, the habitat is unique. Um, it would be uh, referred to a lot as the UK's rainforest in terms of its importance for species, uh, for carbon, and for its rarity, and it covers around 14% of Northern Ireland in particular. Um, I suppose one of the ways of describing it would be natural capital. So natural capital is defined as the elements of nature that directly or indirectly uh, produce value or benefits to people, including ecosystems, species, fresh water, land, minerals, the air, oceans, as well, of na as, well as natural processes and functions. So a range of different benefits that come from peatlands, and we should value it for all those different various reasons. But at times, we actually just don't. 
patrons are under threat. The majority of patrons in in particular are degraded. This is a picture um, from um, Northern Ireland this year where um, a peatland in Sleeve Donard was interrupt you, you're just cutting out a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a peatland in Northern Ireland um, was severely burned. Um, and this is you can see the impact on this firefighter's face. Um, she'd been fighting the fire for over twenty four hours. Um, and the impact in terms of the environment um, and people was really, really clear to see. So although our peatlands have so much value, um, ecologically, environmentally, culturally, often as a society, we don't put the things in place that can properly protect them, both for now and for future generations. There have been lots and lots of reports in this space. Um, a lot of those very recently done. So um, this is a report, a couple of reports done very recently about valuing peatlands and the importance of ecosystem services and natural capital. This report in particular um, from um, Cambridge Econometrics um, is really important. Um, and it looked at the economic benefits of restoration of peatlands, wetlands and forestry in particular. Um, and looking at them as, as, as natural solutions to climate change and the nature crisis that we find ourselves in. And I've written down kind of some of the key stats for this because this is really important. So bear with me for a second as we go through the stats. So the Econometrics report in particular said the restoration um, projects that they assessed in terms of their um, natural capital benefits demonstrated significant value for money outweighing, significantly outweighing the cost of investment. Natural capital solutions demonstrate a, a variety of not just environmental benefit, but also social, economic uh, benefit, vastly outweighing the costs. They produced the figure that for every one pound spent on, um, on restoration of peatland, salt marshes and woodland, uh, developed and delivered up to £4.62, £1.32 and £2.97 would be generated from the restoration of those habitats in particular. So Peatland, the first one, being £4.62, which is quite important for our audience here today. And the restoration of natural habitats offers further environmental benefits beyond just carbon, so biodiversity, water, uh, flood mitigation, and also air pollution. So lots of um, other sets of benefits, not just carbon, but a range of different benefits. And then the final estimate, which is quite important. So the, the estimates between, um, they estimated that between three to 74 um, temporary jobs created during the investment phase for every 100 hectares restored of natural habitats. So producing those economic benefits um, through uh, the restoration of water, flood mitigation, etc., but also through the creation of jobs for every 100 hectares that uh, was restored in that time. So really important figures there on the importance of the restoration of natural habitats in the fight against the nature and climate crisis. There was also an important uh, report produced this year um, entitled the Disruptor Review, and this work was commissioned by the um, Treasury, which looked at the value of the environment and the importance of the environment on the, on the economy. Um, and it, it very much for the first time put alongside the ecological crisis, alongside the climate crisis and put a value on us not doing anything in that space. And it very much recognized that as one of the key issues that we need to solve alongside the climate crisis. So we're not just in a climate crisis, we're in a nature cl and climate crisis. And we need to do both those things to restore nature and to help in the fight against climate change. So peatland was one of those key habitats that would uh, work alongside those things. So moving forward then, um, another report that was produced this year on nature-based solutions, um, sort of in the UK climate adaptation policy um, done uh, by the RSPB, um, WWF um, and others. So it very much looked at a range of different climate-based solutions uh, or nature-based solutions around the UK and what that might look like. Here's a, a, an example on the first um, index page of the report of the range of different examples there are. 
I'm going to zoom in just on uh, a project that's quite close to my heart, personally, um, in Northern Ireland, um, known as the Garan Plateau. So the Garan Plateau is in the Antrim Hills uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, it is uh, an amazing place if you ever get the chance to visit. Um, you move away from the hustle and bustle of Belfast up into the Antrim Hills uh, to a quiet, serene habitat. That's probably one of Northern Ireland's best examples of an intact peatland. But it wasn't always an intact peatland. Um, it has taken quite a lot of work to get it to where it is now. We entered a partnership project, the RSPB in Northern Ireland, with Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Water and our environment agency to help restore this peatland. This was vitally important, not just for the environment, but for its um, natural protection, but also for um, the important role that that peatland plays in producing good water quality for the, ge the general population around where that habitat is. So in 2010, when we first started the restoration project, uh, the habitat condition was poor. Um, it was an unfavorable condition. Um, but we entered into a partnership agreement with Northern Ireland Water and NIEA to help restore the project. We drew, we drew down some European funding um, to help get the restoration um, underway. And we started in 2010. And in 2016, um, in the last, um, if it would move on, at the last assessment, um, the map should show, there we go, that um, the restoration of the habitat is significantly improved because of the works that have been put in place. Now a lot of the works that were put in place were essentially peat dams. So where there were lots of drains cut in the bog before to help the flow of water get quickly to the reservoir, uh, what we did uh, in partnership with our contractors was to put peat dams in place to slow the flow of water um, and that allowed the bog to re-wet. So that is critical in peatland restoration, um, not just in Ireland, in the UK, but globally, is to keep the water in the ground, keep the peat wet. Um, and recently, just in 2010, uh, or in 2020, in 2021, we got an assessment done of the economic benefits of that restoration project. So it came out showing that for every one pound spent, um, it would deliver three pounds 91 in terms of benefits um, to society. So every one pound spent in restoration would deliver three pounds 91 in benefits to society. So that's, that's a, a bit of a no-brainer in terms of an investment in peatland restoration for the future. But not only that, um, it improved flood mitigation by 27% um, and, ero and erosion reduced by 27%. Also then, in terms of 2010, um, in terms of emissions, um, we were looking at around 16,000 tonnes of carbon being emitted into the atmosphere because the bog um, was in poor condition, um, and a loss of about 1.2 million in terms of it, the carbon value based on carbon values in the carbon market. But in 2016, as restoration started to bed in, um, we were looking at emissions, still, still emissions, but um, a lot less, 10,000 tons less and a lot less money in terms of the value of peatland that wasn't uh, being realised at the time. Um, and then in 2045 they estimate that instead of emitting carbon it'll be sequestering um, over 1,100 tons of carbon and delivering back 83,000. So that was just the carbon value in and of itself but it was also going to produce in terms of the restoration seven jobs um, for every year that the project would continue. So people working on that site. So it's not a massive site, but it is a few thousand hectares. Uh, so seven jobs for people continuing to work on the restoration of that site and 16 additional jobs in the wider countryside in terms of people um, supporting the restoration of that project um, through organizations like us and others um, who would continue to work for the restoration of that project. Um, that report um, you can find here, so we did that in partnership um, with Natural Capital Solutions. Um, if you want a bit more information on that report or want a link to that report, please come to me um, afterwards and I'll get you a bit more information on that. And we worked uh, with Jim uh, from Natural Capital Solutions on that report. So thanks to Jim and acknowledge those guys for, for their work on that. And also just to finish then, it was mentioned earlier, since that report's been done, we've had published a peatland strategy produced for Northern Ireland. So as we've said, that's in draft at the minute, and we're hoping that that peatland strategy will help us realize the full potential 
of our peatlands in Northern Ireland and working in collaboration with colleagues around the UK, seeing all of our peatlands restored and moving towards restoration uh, by 2050 or earlier. Thank you very much. <laughs>
It's got pretty much all of our breeding uh, common scoters. It's got um, also fabulous um, breeding black-throated divers. So there it was. The ecological significance of this area really only began to dawn on people in the 1970s. And it was then that I started reading about it and actually as a teenager got a bus up from Glasgow up to Caisson. It took ages to get there but by, by bus to actually see it and touch uh, this incredible um, ha habitat. Uh, and, and incredible it was. And strangely around that time, uh, at the beginning of the 1980s, um, there was the Conservative Thatcher government in the UK, which had, had enormous political stamina, stayed in power for a very long time, and uh, wanted to do something about unemployment in the Highlands, and decided the good way to do it would be to actually exploit this peatland by turning it into commercial forestry. And what they did was introduce a series of fiscal incentives and tax breaks for private forestry companies to plough up and plant non-native commercial conifer trees in this habitat. And it really was a pretty spectacular disruption to look at. So basically the whole ground was ploughed over a double ploughing every two metres. And these trees, because the trees can only live in dry conditions, had to be planted on the top of the mound that had been turned over. And then they had to be fertilised. And these trees were then fertilised with a helicopter flying over, spraying nitrogen fertiliser onto the ground, onto a habitat which any of the biologists here will know is naturally low in nutrients, and that is one of the things that makes it so special for wildlife. And this is 1980, just after I first went up to the flow country, actually, um, went before the forestry, and that is after the forestry was put in in over that period of 10 years in 1990. About 67,000 hectares. Each one of these little squares here is a kilometre. 67,000 hectares of forestry was put in. And that's what it looks like. Um, this was catastrophic, ecologically speaking. This was habitat destruction on a massive, massive scale. And the wildlife suffered accordingly, as we know from the from bird monitoring results and, and other surveys. When all that was happening, the idea of anthropogenic climate change was virtually unheard of. Um, not so now. Now we know that the flow country holds twice as much carbon, at least, as, as the whole forest complement of the whole of the UK put together. That's 400 megatons of carbon. Now, globally, peatlands hold 600 gigatons of carbon. Um, so this is still just a small part, but it is an important fraction of the global challenge. So during this period, uh, I'm very proud to say my predecessors in the RSPB led a campaign um, against this government planting, purely based on wildlife at that time. And um, it was ferocious. I, rem I remember it very clearly at the time. It was all over the newspapers. It, it, it really reached fever pitch as we got into the kind of late, late 1980s. And for example, Sir Terry Wogan, a really famous broadcaster in, uh, in, in this, and radio DJ, TV presenter in the UK, was one of the investors. When the RSPB started making a noise about this investment, and we became unpopular with him. His audience were, were, were many RSPB members are part of it. This was difficult. This was a really, really difficult campaign. But it ended in a U-turn by uh, the Margaret Thatcher's go government, a, a cessation of the fiscal incentives and permission to go ahead and designate these peatlands under national and international wildlife laws. It was one of the most significant wins for nature that the RSPB and our NGO partners have ever secured in Scotland. And the work now continues. Uh, we had two project, two LIFE projects funded under the LIFE uh, scheme of the, of the European uh, Commission. Um, and laterally, we have the, 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 that was from the 1990s to the early noughties. And then in the sort of, from about 2014, we've had uh, the Flows to the Future project, 
funded by NLHF, um, the, the, uh, the, the Highlands Council, and Nature Scot, the Scottish Government's um, nature agency. And this work consists of cutting the trees down and work to restore the bog and to reprofile the ground. And that project has removed hundreds of thousands of trees. It's worked over thousands of hectares. It's provided advice well out beyond RSPB reserves. It's engaged volunteers and does this. Uh, and it also, by the way, we've built this award-winning observation tower that allows people to see the peatland from uh, the best vantage point, which is raised up, but without damaging it. And does it work for carbon? Well, this is uh, uh, basically a from a 10-year-old restored bog. Carbon out, carbon in. And the blue line, this is a one year, a blue line is the net carbon that is being sequestered by the scissors. You get to the end of the year, you see this restored bog after 10 years is still producing carbon, but a bog that's been restored for 17 years, okay, you see there's a big difference. So there's a long-term effect, but it's a very real effect. And this bog is not only no longer giving out the carbon that Ollie told us about when you plough this ground for forestry, it dries out and you lose the carbon. By re-wetting it, by blocking up the drains, you can see the carbon is now being sequestered again slowly, but it is being sequestered again by this bog, so the emissions have been avoided. It's also, since uh, those 1980s, become a golden age for research into, in, in, into peat bogs. This is work done by the Environmental Research Institute, University of Highlands and Islands, Chris Marshall uh, and colleagues. And what this has done is it's, this is satellites measuring altitude to an accuracy of a couple of centimeters throughout the year. And what they found is, is that the bog in the winter wets up and it rises, and in the summer it goes down. And the scientists are now calling this bog breathing. And they found that by examining tiny changes in the way that the bog moves throughout the year, both up and down and laterally, it's telling us a huge amount about it. And in this lower diagram here, this is, this, this is the data from the satellite. That there is a floating road that was put in to access a development. You can see the impact it's having on the peat with your own eyes. But you would never notice it for, by yourself um, from, the, um, from the ground. We've also come a huge way in terms of the Scottish Government's support for Peatland. So the Peatland Action Fund set up under Nature Scotland, the government's nature agency. And when the climate emergency was formally recognised by the Scottish Government in 2019, an additional £250 million for Peatland work was, was announced at the same time, um, uh, which is significant. And, it's made a, 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 and it will make a big difference, but it's not nearly enough. I was asking Stuart Brooks of the IUCN and the National Trust for Scotland earlier, just before I came on, said, what's your top line message? And he said, we have to scale up. The big task that's facing humanity now is to scale up on this sort of restoration because it can deliver for climate and it can deliver for nature. It's by scaling up this sort of thing that we address the twin nature and climate emergency most effectively. And that's going to need investment. And is it worth it? Well. Yeah, it's great for birds, and I love birds, but I really love all biodiversity, to be honest. This is a desmid. This, 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 this is a tiny, single-celled alga, okay, that does really well in the bog, and, the, and these desmids are excellent indicators of habitat quality. This one um, is actually IUCN listed as critically endangered, and the flow country of Caithness and Sutherland is a stronghold for it. Um, so, to me... We not only have common sense and human well-being to think about, we have our moral responsibility towards a wider living world. And just before we sort of um, I, I hand over, I just, we're very lucky to have in the audience Millie Hayward. Millie Hayward is a young volunteer who works at our Forsenard Reserve and every day does this peatland restoration work with her hands. Millie, would you just say a few words? Of, uh, you know, just to, about what your days are like. We can't hear her. Okay. Yeah. yeah Hi, everyone. You. So I'm Millie, um, and Paul asked me to say a few words about my work on the Force and Art Reserve. Um, so I was lucky enough to grow up in the Highlands, so I also grew up around the peatlands. 
um, and I spent lots of my childhood out walking across them. Um, and yeah, then I've had the opportunity since graduating to go and intern there and get involved with so much, so much of the amazing restoration work that's going on there. Um, and it's incredible to see when you look out on the flows, you can see you know, the pristine bog which hasn't yet been touched and how incredible it is and such an amazing place for wildlife um, and as its role as a carbon store. Um, but then you can also see all the different phases of restoration going on. You can see the restoration that's been happening you know, since the 90s or the 2000s when it was just at the beginning um, but you can also see the restoration that's going on right now. They're felling standing forestry as we speak at Forcenard. Um, and then we also still have lots of standing forestry that we still need to tackle and still need to get the funding to fell um, and start the restoration process. Um, and the reserve at Forcenard is not just one big um, piece of area that's all together it's quite fragmented um, in between these bits of standing forestry so there's a continuous battle with even once you've fell to the forestry that's on the RSPB's land there is also the struggle of fighting the regenerating conifers that are um, coming onto the RSPB's land from the forestry that we don't own and can't fell yet and there's also an edge effect around the forestry where wildlife won't come back within, I don't know, 500 meters, say, of the standing forestry. So even if you can restore as much of the area as you can that you own, you are still having to tackle this standing forestry, which we don't own. Um, and that is just an ongoing battle that the RSPB will have to, we have to spend our resources in having to tackle the standing forestry. Um, but as I said, it's incredible to be doing the work and be there on the ground. Um, just last week, I was there um, cutting down all of the little conifers that are regenerating at the moment. Um, but seeing all of the tiny little amazing aspects of the bog that a lot of people don't get to see. I think even in the highlands, if you've grown up around the bog, you don't quite appreciate what it's like until you're there and lots of people will walk past the bog, they live beside it but they don't truly understand how important it is. And that's why we have so many problems with people damaging the bog in the past because like it's been mentioned before, people thought they were doing something good. They thought that by turning the peatlands into you know, forestry or trying to use it for agriculture, they were using the best of it they can. And I think that now we know better, it's our job to try and educate other people on what really is best and how we can use it to the best of our abilities. Brilliant. Well, what can I say? Thanks, Thanks Millie. <laughs> Millie's fantastic. So thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you for agreeing to do that. It's brilliant. Um, okay, now uh, it is my great privilege to um, introduce Tom Kershey of NABU. Um, one of the most wonderful things that work with the RSPB is we are, of course, part of a family, the BirdLife International family. And Tom is from our, our partners, NABU, in Germany. And he's uh, by pre-recorded video, I believe. Okay, fire away, guys. Do I have to move on? Dear visitors of the Peatland Pavilion here at the COP26 uh, in Glasgow. My name is Tom Kirscher and I'm the head of the International Peatland and Southeast Asia team uh, in NABU headquarters. NABU is BirdLife Germany and I'm going to talk about um, international collaborations and the ambition level we need to raise in terms of peatland restoration. From an European Union perspective, the biggest funding program uh, available for peatland restoration is life. Life is um, next year becoming 30 years old, which is quite a good time to have a look back uh, and look for the numbers. In the past almost 30 years, in five phases, 6.5 billion euros have been spent from the EU, total leveraging nearly 15 billion euros. 
in the fifth funding phase, life climate action was implemented. So before it had an exclusive focus on biodiversity and other environmental issues. And Life Peat Restore was one of the first projects on peatland restoration under this sub-program. Sub Among the 4,600 projects, around 80 peatland restoration projects have been implemented. Nearly all of them had a Natura 2000 habitat restoration or species habitat focus. In total, almost 50,000 hectares have been restored, which means have been net influenced in their hydrological regime. For the sixth funding period, the European Commission had proposed to spend a total of 5.45 billion euros, which is only 1 billion less than all the five phases before altogether. That's quite substantial increase. Let's have a look on our live Petri store project. In live Petri store, nine partners came together from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Germany. NABU was the coordinating beneficiary, or is still the coordinating beneficiary as this project is going to um, be finished uh, by end of this year. Come back to the, to the partners. The partners ranging from universities to environmental NGOs, from cooperatives, to, um, to peat producing associations. On this map, you can see um, the distribution of our restoration sites. So uh, we had in total 11, ranging from uh, a site nearby Berlin uh, in Germany um, to Suosu Leider, so the biggest site um, in Western Estonia. The project duration was five years and the budget being spent uh, was uh, more than 6 million euros. As you all know, um, this time was also necessary because um, peatland restoration requires solid planning. For all the sites, we needed to prepare um, such maps and including technical design and get them approved by the authorities, which took a substantial part of the time before the actual restoration measures, closing the draining ditch ditches could be happening. Apart from that, we also implemented an intensive monitoring system. When it comes to climate, of course, direct flux measurements, as you can see here with um, chambers is one of the most appropriate methods, but we at the same time combined this approach with uh, measuring um, the water table, the hydrological regime, but we also used vegetation as a proxy and implemented the so-called guest greenhouse gas emission site type approach. So, and later on, we compared all these data with one another. And um, the first results indicate that the time um, to implement such projects um, is too short to really um, see the big influence. But what we can uh, see, for example, here, uh, one of the, from one of the sites, two years compared, with one another with um, different uh, precipitation levels. And uh, later on, these data uh, have been modeled um, and gave us uh, insights into um, the um, yeah, emission levels from these sites. And then uh, we could um, compare and see that uh, after the restoration, 
the emission, especially from CO2, has almost come to a stop. Of course, these sites turn um, take longer to to turn into net sink ecosystems again, but this have been the first results which have been possible in this short period of time. To answer the question, if this is sufficient, um, we need. I need to remind you back about what uh, life has been funding for the past 30 years. And we have to have a look for the IPCC scenario report for 1.5 degree path, um, where we could see three messages. One is that all the drained, uh, all the undrained uh, peatlands, so 90% of the peatlands which are still pristine and intact, they need to uh, be preserved um, and function as net sinks uh, continuously. Secondly, we need to stop the drainage of 50% of the peatlands by 2030 and start phasing out peat extraction and consumptive peat use. This is also necessary to come to the third step, which is to get the rest and keep all the peatlands wet by 2050, globally and without any exception. This is necessary in order to um, have these peatlands functioning as net carbon sinks after 2050. So the global restoration target is quite clear. It is 50 million hectares or half a million square kilometers. For Germany, um, organic soils, including uh, PT soils and peatlands, are uh, summing up to 1.8 million hectares. So this is a restoration target for the upcoming 29 years. In order to achieve that, we need to get out of the silo, scale up restoration. So to make this really clear compared to what we have achieved in the European Union in the past uh, 30 years in terms of peatland restoration, we need to increase our ambition level by a thousand times. We need to prohibit consumptive peat use, but also import and export. We don't want to um, export the climate uh, damage to other countries. In particular for the European Union, we need to change the common agricultural policy and end subsidizing the climate dump agriculture and start supporting climate smart solutions, including paludiculture. So what is NABU's approach or NABU's contribution to that? First, um, advocacy with more than 860,000 members and supporters in Germany. NABU's voice seems strong and getting stronger every year. So we need to use that for lobbying a new ambition level in national, but also international peatland restoration policy for example, when it comes to the about to be formed new coalition in Germany uh, for the federal government or the reshaping of the EU renewable energies policy, or as already mentioned, the CAP, the common agricultural policy. With regards to the US EU methane pledge, we just need to make sure that no misleading discussions about methane and peatland rewetting cost us more time and hold us back from acting. About awareness, public relation and education, a whole society needs to change to be able to consume peat-free vegetables. And again, 860,000 members and supporters at the same time are consumers and we need to work on them. We need to work on and educate also ourselves. And on boosting peatland restoration, um, restoration requires implementing organizations. 
we have been happy to collaborate with wonderful partners in the past five years in Life Peter's tour. Most of the results you can find on our webpage. Um, and this is also necessary for the upcoming years. So I'm happy to announce that we are also coordinating beneficiary of another LIFE project, which is called LIFE Multipeat with partners in Ireland, the Netherlands, Belgium, Poland, and Germany. And we also need to involve the private sector. So this is basically what I wanted to present to you. Um, thank you for your attention. My take home messages are clear. The time to act is now and we have to make peatlands wet again. And you can find the results of Live Peat Restore, including all the monitoring results on our webpage, www.life-peat-restore.eu slash en. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant to hear that NABU membership has grown since I last looked, which is uh, amazing news. Uh, now I'm really, really pleased and relieved to say that uh, Becky, Becky Spate, the Chief Executive of the RSPB, has managed to make it here, and she's managed to have a bit of a breather, I hope, and she'll be able to just say a few words to kind of sum up what we've heard today, and then also um, hopefully sort of um, chair the question answer session. The questions are on the tablet there, Becky. Thanks very much. Well done. Yeah, Can you hear me now? Yes, fantastic. You were very patient. Uh, so just to say, I mean, I've just kind of got under the wire and got in here, so I'm so sorry to be late, but I did hear most of the session, um, and it was fantastic. And I think one of the things that I'm finding really exciting about being here is this sense of kind of stuff going in, going on kind of here, um, actually physically in COP, but then all these people online, I've been watching what the experience is like for people who are listening to this session online. And that's, it. so it's really great to have that mixture going on. And although it feels a bit weird, it's a bit like being in a silent disco, sort of sitting watching you all kind of listening here. But it's actually, it's a really kind of inclusive experience in that sense. So it's been great to see it happening. Um, so I'm Becky Spate. I am the chief executive of the RSPB. Um, and we are also not only kind of work in the UK, but we're part of BirdLife International as well. Um, and we work right around the world, really, from kind of places in you know, the South Atlantic, um, uh, you know, in Indonesia, um, in West Africa, um, right through to kind of here in the UK. And one of the things I'm really proud of, and it was great kind of hearing uh, the guys talking from the RSPB in the session, is that I think what we managed to do is take a really good kind of bird's eye view of the situation so we work very much um, on systemic change and the change that we know we all need in terms of addressing the climate and nature emergency but we also work in the detail so you know some of what Millie was talking about in terms of the work we're doing on the ground and to save specific species so that kind of mix I think is really powerful working at both ends of the telescope if you like um, and I guess in terms of this conference, I mean, I mean, coming here on the train today and just kind of listening to the media here in the UK over the weekend, it's been amazing to hear the conversation going on around the stuff that we all know here is so important. It's been so exciting to hear that conversation. And yes, there's been negative stuff and kind of criticism and all of that stuff. But actually, you know, that kind of momentum that this kind of event can generate for this most important of causes, it is so important, I think, and this kind of session where we can understand some of the issues that we've got to face into is just fantastic. Um, so here at the RSPB, 
And that's my kind of experience, really. You know, we have got quite a lot of experience now on nature-based solutions, of which kind of restoring our peat, and we all know, is one. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that experience ranges from things like kind of coastal adaptation work at places like Medmerry in Sussex and kind of dealing with the kind of coastal inundations we're going to get and the intertidal habitat that we're losing, creating more of that, right through to this kind of work peatland restoration where we're doing lots of that kind of going on at the moment in Doveston, uh, working with a, a water company, United Utilities. We heard about the flow country. We heard about the work on the Garon Plateau in Northern Ireland. So lots of that going on. Um, and we're also doing lots of woodland regeneration as well. And that was happening at places like Horswater, for example, in the Lake District, which I came through on the train um, just this morning. So I thought the sessions um, earlier on did a really good job of talking to us about the global situation and then homing in a bit more on Europe but also on the UK in particular um, and you know some of those stats are really kind of awesome I think and just bear a little bit of repetition so you know peatland is our largest natural terrestrial carbon store so that's on a global level and it, you know, it locks up 42% of oil, the soil, all the soil carbon around the world. It's such an important habitat. Um, and it's found in 180 countries around the world, um, about 4 million square kilometres of peatland around the world, and it's about 3% of the global land surface. So it's doing a heck of a lot of work, given that it doesn't take up that much of our global land surface. And it ranges from places like the Blanket Bog in the Flow Country, which um, Paul did such a great job of talking about, right through to places like the Swamp Forests of Southeast Asia. So it does have this incredible range. Um, and it, you know, we are still discovering it around the world. So the world's largest tropical peatland was only discovered in 2017 and registered as such, sitting beneath the forests of the Congo Basin. So we are still finding more of this really, really crucial habitat. And we've heard about the kind of problems that face it around the world. So those are the problems of drainage. So about 15% of the world's peatlands have been drained. That's a big problem. Um, agricultural conversion, so converting it for agricultural purposes um, and converting also for forestry. And we heard about that in the flow country, of course, that great, well, awful example, really, of what went on there. Um, and of course, burning is still a problem, you know, mining it for fuel. You know, damaged peatlands are responsible, we think, for about 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions from the land use sector globally um, and about 5.6% of global anthropogenic CO2 emissions. So, you know, it's, do, it's, it's, not, it's doing a bad job for us at the moment and it could be doing a much better job. When you, when you home in from that global perspective and you look in on the UK, then you're talking really about blanket bog, about raised bog and about fenland. And Ollie, when I walked in earlier, Ron was talking a lot about the farming that goes on on some of our fenland and the damage that that has caused. Um, so here in the UK, the... the the reason we bang on so much about blanket bog is that we've got about 13% here in the UK of all the world's blanket bog. So it's a particularly important habitat here in the UK. Um, again, peatland's about 10% of the UK um, land area, about 3 million hectares altogether. Um, and it's, it's locking up about 3 billion tonnes of carbon. So that's equivalent to all the carbon that is stored in forests in the UK, in France, and in Germany put together. So it's incredibly important. And I always think it's kind of suffered a bit from, it's not been that charismatic kind of poster child that trees are. And I know when I talk about trees, I always talk about them as being the cathedrals of the natural world. You can kind of paint this kind of beautiful picture of trees and how important they are to us as people on so many different levels. But peatland is, is kind of, it's the kind of, it's the ugly sister in a way, but it's the absolute foundation of nature-based solutions. You know, it may not be glamorous, but it is so important. And I would say that it might not be glamorous, but they are still fantastic habitats to go and visit and to be in and to see. And I can still remember going out to um, Lake Vernui in Wales and kind of, I, there's, a, there's a great kind of um, stick that sits in one of the kind of big areas of blanket bog on Lake Vernui. And the trick is that the team always say to you, pull it out. And you start pulling and it's like the sword of Excalibur. You just keep pulling and pulling and pulling until this cane taller than me comes out because that is how deep 
that bog is. So it may not be glamorous, but it's incredibly exciting as a habitat. And of course, it's got amazing species associated with it. So if you think globally, you know, the decline of the Bornean orangutan by 60% in the last 60 years, a lot of that is to do with the loss of its peat swamp habitat. So that loss of habitat is having a direct impact on some of our rarest species. And here in the UK, of course, we talk about golden plover, we talk about hen harriers, we talk about the amazing sphagnum moss that forms peat in the first place. If you've ever had the chance to get a handful of sphagnum moss and squeeze it in a healthy bog, the amount of water that it's holding is quite incredible. And of course, it's the moss that was used as a, it was used as a dressing for wounds in battles hundreds of years ago, because it's got that absorbent quality. And it's the sphagnum moss that, of course, goes on to form the peat but it only forms at the rate of about a millimetre a year. So it's really slow and precious process that sequesters and forms the peat. So, you know, today we've heard so much about kind of the restoration work that's going on. And it's one of the things that fills me with optimism about this particular nature based solution to climate change is that we know a lot about it. We've been doing a lot of this you know, around the UK, around the world. So we do know how to do this. It is an issue of scale, political will, and funding it to make sure we can do it fast enough. Um, so um, I, it's been very inspiring for me, as you can probably tell, listening to the guys talking. Um, we're going to move now to a, a Q&A. Um, uh, and uh, I've got, we've got some questions that have come in online. You might have questions. you can restore it and the RSPB can advise you on that actually as, because it's actually it's not just about blocking that drain and that drain you really have to have an idea of what the water table looks like and that takes quite a lot of experience and we do have guys who uh, and women of course who, 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 who know that stuff and we'll be able to advise you through our advisory department so those are the two things that I, I, I would say. Great thank you Paul thank you. 
Uh, right, I'm going to move to a question online now. Um, so this has been the one that's been most upvoted. It says, how does the RSPB and other organisations measure or quantify the success of restoration? So how do we know we're succeeding? And I think, Ollie, I'm going to come to you to perhaps give us a view on that one. Thank you. Um, I guess two things. One is, is the peat itself, are the peat forming bits of vegetation recovering? So that's largely the sphagnum moss and, and the, the collection of sphagnum mosses that form a peat bog, which um, of course are amazing things in that they live, the very different species require slightly different levels of hydrology and wetness. And having that variety of sphagnum moss, I think is really important. And it's probably going to become more important as our summers get drier in that we'll, we'll probably see a greater proportion of the drier loving sphagnum species. But for our RSPB, of course, um, this having the birds coming back, that's the real hit for us. And as ever, birds are, if you've got healthy bird populations and wading, wading bird populations, you're probably doing pretty well with the rest of the bog as well. And so I mentioned that at Dovestone, I think 10 years to double the wading breeder population and indeed, I think Dunlins came from naught to 10 pairs in around that time as well. So let's have healthy bogs, which are wet, humming with insects, um, which provide food for wading birds. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, right, I have a question now. This has been directed particularly at Marion. So um, Marion, um, a question online um, that says, what plans and funding is Natural England working towards for peatland restoration after the current funding runs out in 2025? So, question for you. Um, the short answer is, Becky, we don't know yet. Um, I was hoping that answer question was going to be, what funding have we got now? Because I could have answered that very confidently, which is we have um, over 50 million now to go up ever so slightly on the back of the budget last week, the Chancellor announced an increase for that whole Nature for Climate Fund, which is for both peat and trees. So we have plenty of funding, capital funding now for peat and restoration. We've just made the first round of grants um, and we're also in the middle of what we call the discovery phase, which is for people who want to do the more innovative stuff and aren't sure exactly what they want to do yet. There's a bit of a sort of a, a learning and, and, and um, exploration grant available now. After 2025, we don't know what the funding is, but I think it is fair to say um, that the funding will continue. It may get wrapped into the Future Elm Scheme, the Future Environmental Land Management Scheme, which is the um, English version of Future Farm Payments. So I can't tell you what the budget will be, but I could probably bet pretty firmly there will be ongoing funding for peatland restoration, not least because all of the things we're talking about today, it's going to be a big part of UK government's commitment to climate change it features in the um low net zero uh, strategy that was published last week so i think there will be ongoing funding but i can't tell you how much that's that's great that's great to hear mary and i think you know the issues we were hearing today and as you know very well it's all about kind of scale and urgency so um hopefully that ongoing funding doesn't just carry on but kind of ramps up as well and that feels instinctively like what we should be doing with some of these nature-based solutions but that's really good to hear so thank you for that um i'm going to go back to the room uh, yes yeah global environment center in malaysia uh, we in southeast asia we have a lot of challenges with the peat management and uh, the differences and similarities between uh, southeast asia to the european situation we're hearing about uh, one of the issues that we're facing challenge, how to scale up the uh, restoration. We've got maybe about four or five million hectares that needs restoring and how to get the resources there. Um, and uh, I, I see in Europe a lot of uh, grants and other things are available and funding available. Um, but I'm not certain about what progress you've made on getting the private sector or the landowners to change. This has been one of our big success in Southeast Asia where government introduced new regulation and every landowner on peat must manage the water table to a certain standard. If they don't, there are penalties involved. And uh, is that being looked at in Europe as a way to really scale up to all the landowners? I see in, in UK you had massive fires in the Pennine peatlands, somewhat linked to drainage by private landowners. And what is being done about that by the government just to stop it tomorrow? 
it could be stopped by the government tomorrow if you legislate for it. So just like to hear that perspective. Thank you. I think I think this is a two a two side question. So Tom, I'm going to come to you and ask you just to comment in terms of the kind of European perspective and the South Asia comparison that was being drawn there. Because I think you're probably best placed to do that. Um, and then Marion, I'm going to come to you just to kind of talk about the kind of perspective around kind of wildfires and the rewetting of peat and and how we kind of legislate for that if necessary and is that the route we want to go down um, and uh, and Ollie might have a view on that as well so it's almost it's three ways now right okay Tom first of all well I in my presentation I briefly Ollie, we lost you there for a moment. Can you just repeat what you said? No, you can't hear me. Ollie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. That's so why I thought okay. Tom was speaking. No, no, yeah. no I, I, Tom, Tom, we lost you there. Can you just repeat what you said? No. On mute. We can't, we can't hear you, Tom. Okay. I am going to go to um, Marion then to answer that question from the legislative perspective, I think, first of all, and then to Ollie for a comment. Marion. Um, I'm going to start, Becky, before I move on to the legislative point, the sort of the banning of burning point. I think the other I think that question is a really personal one because I'm looking in front of me at the moment at the list of grants that have been given so far in England, and none of them are to private landowners. They are either to wildlife trusts or local authorities or water companies. So I think the question is a really pertinent one: is how do we get landowners to understand private landowners? To understand the part they can play in peat and restoration, and that's um, and I guess I'll try, I'll try not to answer my own question, but that point about how do we get landowners to get? I think that first question we had from a landowner had some food for thought for me. And the point I might have added in answer to that question is the other thing we need to be doing more is talking about peatland. It's not a habitat that's been talked about a lot. It's not been particularly valued. So there's something about those of us in the conservation sector to be having those 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 discussions and, and talking about peatland and its value to private landowners. So there's something about wanting private landowners, particularly in the lowlands, this is not just an upland, this is also a lowland issue. How do we get those that currently farm quite intensively on peat to think about options? So I think, I think I'm think i not, I'm answering the question with a question, which is a very bad habit, but I think the point is really well made and it's something we all need to keep working on. In terms of legislation, as many in the audience will know, um, there has now been legislation in England to, record, to ban burning on deep peat. So landowners now need a license to burn on deep peat. And I would note as a statement of fact, no applications have yet been submitted for a license to burn on deep peat. Um, but of course, that does not mean that all upland burning is outlawed. It is only outlawed on deep peat. So I think, as we said at the time of that government announcement, it's a step in the right direction. But it's certainly something to keep under review whether that first step is going to be enough to really tackle the issue. I might leave Ollie to comment more on, on what more is needed. Thank you. Over, over to you. Um, Thank you. And uh, absolutely, I agree with you, Marion, entirely. We need to be talking this up to landowners. But it's actually really heartening to hear that in Southeast Asia, there is legislation at this scale. And I would love to see this come in better in our four across our four countries to make sure that we get, as I said in my talk, the public goods and the public benefits from our peatlands instead of these remaining largely in private um, land holdings and for private gain, actually at greater public cost. And perhaps, you know, our climate emergency, our nature emergency, these twin crises of our age are the catalyst for having better legislation. And instead of talking about it in terms of red tape, let's have it as in the form of a green direction or something like that. Um, that actually is a positive way. Legislation should be positive to get the better benefits out of it. And I'd really like to see that develop. On burning, of course, that's even, Marin quite rightly said it's only on deep peat. It's actually only on a part of deep peat. Um, it's only on those sites, ironically, that are designated as European sites. And for gardening peat, yes, the first steps are being made, but they are tiny in comparison to what the government has legislated the car industry to do uh, in terms of 
moving away from fossil fuels. And I don't see why making those legislative changes shouldn't be made appealing to the public so that we can actually get these kind of changes for the land, for nature, for everything, for the future of, our, of the climate and all of us who live here. Actually, this is what we should, we could and perhaps should be driving for. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, Tom, to have missed out your, your bit, but I'm sure, um, I'm sure we could catch up on that uh, later if necessary. Um, we've probably got time for one more question. <laughs> They're going, one, one. Uh, one more question. So, um, yeah, this is an interesting one. So, actually, John, I'm going to come to you for a first comment on this. Um, just uh, it, the question is, is the RSPB still looking to acquire more peatland as nature reserves? Has the speculative carbon market priced NGOs out of the market? So, John, give me a view on that from a Northern Ireland perspective. Yeah, so from, from an NI perspective, I suppose, um, our land agents are always looking for more peatland for its restoration. So I suppose, first and foremost, that's what we're looking for. Um, we look to acquire habitat uh, for the importance of its biodiversity value. And, um, and its uh, importance for restoration value. Um, in terms of the carbon markets, um, it's, it's something that we are looking at, but we don't yet have a, a firm position on it, I suppose, um, is, is probably where we're at with that. Um, but for the time being, I suppose, we're looking at peatland for its restoration value and its importance um, in terms of habitat for some of our most threatened species. So uh, to give you an example, um, curlew, for example, are a really important um, upland species in Northern Ireland, um, and we would be looking to acquire uh, land um, for the restoration of curlew. Some of our most important habitats in the Antrim Hills, for example, um, have probably over half of the entire um, Ireland breeding population um, of curlew, so if we were looking for, for more habitat in that regard, that would be our top priority. If there were benefits beyond that, then we would look at that when, it, when the time comes. I mean, the, the only thing I would add to that is that, um, you know, land is just kind of, the price of land is doing this, you know. Um, I don't know about worldwide, in the UK, it's just doing that. And that's about, kind of, that is about some of this speculation, I think. Um, and it's big pension funds buying into their future and so on. So I, I, I think for the RSPB, we absolutely will go on acquiring, but we will also want to work with partners around kind of making sure that the right management goes into place on some of that land. We don't necessarily have to own it to get the right outcomes. So I think, you know, that will make, it already makes up some of what we do. I think it'll probably start making up more of what we do, but, um, but time will tell. Um, and talking of time, yes, we are out of time. <laughs> Um, so, uh, listen, thank you so much for being here in the room and online. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but it was so good to have you with us on, you know, our first sort of silent disco outing here in the, here in the Peak Pavilion. And there is lots more planned over the two-week period here, I know. So um, come back and, um, and join in again. And uh, thank you so much for being part of the conversation here at COP26, where we need to find some answers and make them happen. Thank you.